Okay, so we're going to be talking about the Pareto principle today, the 80-20 principle. So basically, we're going to go through just briefly the definition of it, go through some examples of it, and so please look at some different ways that you can apply it to your life. And we'll talk about your health, but it's really you can pick any really area that you want to apply this to. So we'll go through some specific examples, and then I've got some questions, questions I'll actually send with you guys, and we'll walk through it. And what really been cool for you guys tonight is to walk out the door with at least maybe one or two, maybe three really small action stuff that you can start. So you can start to make these things a habit. So kind of think of that that way. There's a lot of stuff and you can kind of look at it more when we get done, but try to pick just one or two things that when we get done here tonight, that I'm starting out either tonight or tomorrow. Make sense? Okay, so let's talk about really about what it is. And again, give me some ideas on how you can start to apply this. So the Pareto Principle is also known as the 80-20 rule. It's a theory maintaining that 80% of your output or your results are coming from 20% of your input, okay? So if we look at, for example, um, you were in sales, maybe you can, can well, verify yeah, this. They, they talk about all the time in sales. 20% of your customers get 80% of your business, always. 20% of your salespeople do 80% of your sales, So I was just gonna ask you. Yeah. Uh, at 20% of the realtors do 80% of the sales now, always. Right? Ah, yeah. and, uh, and those 20% are doing something right, obviously, that allows them to do that. Right, right. Okay. So we look at that business-wise, we can look at um, an employee's time. So if you guys work at a business or if you own a business, kind of like you're saying with the real estate agents, is you may have a lot of different things to do, but 20% of the things that you do actually get the actual results. So maybe if you work in a, in a business, you've got to turn the lights on, you've got to send an email, maybe you've got to make some copies, but that really doesn't get you the results that you need. There's these 20% that gets you the results that you need. So how do we narrow that down to be more effective and spend more time on that 20% that actually gets you results, whether it's in business, relationships, money, health, nutrition, all those different things. Uh, also, the negative side, I'm going to call it the negative side, 20% of the bugs, software bugs, for example, are come, um, account for 80% of the software failures. Or in a business, 20% of your customers are going to give you 80% of your results. So 20% of the things that you do in any given area give you 80% of your problems. So again, if we can narrow that down, not that we're going to be perfect by any means, but we can narrow that down and say, okay, how do I really be aware of this, why I'm making decisions in this area, and, and obviously decrease that to have less than negative results in your lives. Make sense? Okay. So I'll give you a couple more practical examples how we can kind of break this down. So if we look at, let's say you're the city manager, I know when you guys work on road stuff, but just for an example, let me start to get and break it down to yourselves. If you're, let's say, a city manager for Helena, and we've got to repair the roads in Helena, and there is $10 million worth of roads that need to be that need to be fixed, we've only got a million dollars to fix those, okay? So we go that there's 20% of the roads in Helena, roughly, that are gonna carry 80% of the traffic, okay? So let's say, I'm just gonna make this up, I have no idea what the, what the answer is, but let's say that is um, North Rodney. North Rodney? <laughs> <laughs> so let's say it's, uh, let's say Prospect, Montana and Custer Avenue, okay? So if we were to fix just those three roads, that would cover 80% of the traffic. Again, I'm just making this up, I don't know the answer is. But, again, that's gonna cost, let's say, five million dollars. We don't have five million dollars, okay? So if we can go to 20% of these three roads, right? So if we take Montana Avenue, there's maybe a six block stretch that really carries the majority of the traffic. And there's an eight block stretch of Custer that carries the majority of the traffic. Does that make sense? So now if we go to 20% of the 20%, we go that 64% uh, of the traffic is carried by 4% of the roads. Is that making sense so far? And then if you go that section, we still don't have the money to cut it. Now if you go to 20% of that 20%, this is really getting down to details, 0.8% um, uh, carries 52% of the traffic, okay? Does that make sense when we explain this? So now we go, okay, we can, only, we can afford to fix this area and this area in this area, but that's going to solve 52% of the problems. Does that make sense? Because the bottom line is, in your life, you can do anything, but you can't do everything, right? So you can't mow your yard, clean the garage, clean your house, get all your kids ready. You can't do everything. You have to choose what are the most important things. Now you can delegate things, but maybe you have limited resources as well. So we have to decide what is the most most important things. How do we get those things done? And then how do we be as, as efficient as we can in those areas, okay? So I'll make it a little more practical. So in your home, 
And think about this for your home right now specifically. You spend 80% of your time in 20% of your home, okay? So it's your, it's your bedroom, it's your kitchen. So for me, it's my bedroom, um, my kitchen, and then I've got a home office and a home gym. That's probably where I spend the majority of my time, okay? So if we look at that and go, okay, so with my, what I do with my office here after I learn this, I'm gonna make my office be at the best it can possibly be, right? So I clean everything up, I get everything organized, and I walk in there, I'm much more productive, I do a much better job, and I spend the majority of the time there, okay? Now I'll give you an example of mine, so I have to pick up my neighbor, I don't know my neighbor real well, but I have a neighbor a few doors down from us that's got a beautiful house, a beautiful yard, and he's out there quite a bit doing yard work, and his front yard is manicured, it looks beautiful, now, I've literally never seen anybody in his front yard other than him when he's mowing it and working on it. So we've got this beautiful yard. I mean, very, we're in a cul-de-sac or, or, or subdivision where there's very few drive traffic, right? Now, maybe it's his hobby and just enjoys doing it, but it's a lot of energy and effort to an area that doesn't get used. Does that make sense? You guys follow me on this? So you might have an area in your house where you spend all this energy decorating and it's really nice. There's nothing wrong with that, but you never use that. So you okay, have some nice stuff in there, but in your living room where you, you spend a lot of time watching movies, things like that, buy, buy the really nice couch and put it there and put you know, the halfway decent couch in another area. Is that making sense? So it's finding those areas, for example, that your home and really dialing down those things in, okay? So let's start to make it more practical in terms of your health is, um, I'll give you an example of exercise. So um, when I got into college, I got started pretty serious. I, in, in high school, I played sports and I worked out during the sports season, but I didn't do a lot of working out outside the sports season. And when I got in college, I decided I was gonna be committed to working out, I started working on a regular basis, and probably, I don't know, eight, six, eight, 10 years, I've been working out regularly. And then I learned this technique called the surge or the burst technique, and some of you guys maybe have heard me talk about it before. And so prior to that, I was working out probably an hour and a half, two hours a day, and I was doing like bodybuilding stuff. So I would do a bicep exercise, and I would do a tricep exercise, and I would do an upper chest and a lower chest, and I would an upper app and a lower app and in front of my back, you know, I was doing all these different exercises and it took me a really long time to do my workouts. Well, then I learned about what they call now is HIIT, which is high intensity interval training. And it said, you can get just as good a workout in 12 minutes as you would do in an hour and a half or two hours. And I was like, that doesn't even make sense. It doesn't even make logical sense. But they based on the hormones, they went through the science. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna try it. So the very first time I tried it, all I did, I was in a hotel, which was at the downtown Calgary, and they didn't have a gym, which is pretty rare for a hotel, but they didn't have a gym, so I'm like, and I wanted to work out. So I just stayed in my hotel room, and all I did was push-ups, squats, and I think I did um, burpees. And basically, what you do with this particular workout was, you do as fast, as hard as you can go for 20 seconds, and then recover for 20 seconds, 20 seconds, on. so as fast, as many push-ups I can do for 20 seconds, recover for 20 seconds, as many push-ups I can do for 20 seconds, recover, and then did the same thing with the other exercise. So I did about three minutes total of exercise. That's it. So it took me six minutes, did three minutes of exercise. Does that make sense when I'm explaining it? And I was in very good physical shape at the time. I was like, oh, that felt good. That was, felt like a pretty good workout, better than I thought. Didn't think much of it. I got the next day, and I could hardly move my arm. My chest was so sore, and my legs were so sore from that very, very short workout. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna try it. So I, I, the next six to eight weeks I committed, I only did that style of workout. In about six to eight weeks, I got in the best shape of my life versus what I've been doing for the six or eight years previous that in much less time, much less effort, I've got all this extra time doing these other things. Does that make sense? Not suggesting that you should do exactly that workout, but for me, I do much less effort but doing it the right place at the right time. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, I'll give you another example. A lot of times people, when they want to lose weight, they'll go to the gym and they'll start doing like, let's say cardio. They'll go on the treadmill for half hour, 45 minutes, or go take an aerobics class, or thinking aerobics, lose weight, right? Burn calories. But if they went and took that time instead, a lot of times they're, um, I know I was pretty intimidated when I first started lifting weights, I didn't know what I was doing, I wasn't in shape. So I think especially with women that go to the gym and they don't want to lift weights, I guess it's changed a little bit now, but you know, looking back, a lot of people didn't do this. So you get a lot more bang for your buck. If you went in and lifted weights, if all you did, let's say some squats for five or 10 minutes, legs are the biggest muscles in your body, so you're burning a lot more calories. You build some strength, you have more muscle tone now, muscles burn more calories than fat, so when you get done working out, all you do is cardio, you get done working out, you're done. But if you build some muscle, you're gonna burn more calories and more energy when you're not working out. So you're getting much more results in a shorter amount of time, if we're talking about exercise, for example. Is this, you guys follow me so far? Okay. So, um, now another thing we'll, talk, we'll touch on this a little bit too is mentally, I'll tell you, 
I've been working out for a long time, this is just something I just changed here recently, is that when I'm working out, I kind of got into the habit of working out. So I go work out, I've still been working out very regularly, but I was kind of going through the motions, you know, still working out hard, but I wasn't really pushing myself. Like anything you do for a long time, you can get kind of in the habit and get kind of bored with it. So I just, just about a week and a half ago, I just really shifted my mental focus to be really focused when I was working out, to really, really good, good form and really push those muscles. And just by that switch in my mind, I got a much, much better result working out the same amount of time, simply just shifting my mindset. So again, you can apply this to just so many different areas and how you do things, how to look at things, um, how to avoid things. Is this making sense so far? Okay. So if we get time in the end, I will um, come back and talk about values real briefly as well. I'll give you one more example is um, with healthcare. Um, some of you guys have heard me talk about my stories that I grew up um, with, which I didn't realize until later when I started doing research on autoimmune conditions, is I grew up really sick. I started with ear infections and sore throats. Then I started having digestive issues. And I started having rashes and all these health issues that I was going to the doctor, taking antibiotics, and spending all this energy trying to get healthy and well, and I just wasn't getting any results. And then I got into chiropractic school. I didn't know chiropractic had anything to do with health. I just thought I had to do it back. And I started getting my spine adjusted, and it fixed 80% of my problems with way less effort. This is before I really started working on my nutrition, or any of those type of things. Just by getting my spine adjusted, it started to solve all those problems. If you look at it as a general picture, you go, okay, you can go weeks without food, but you can only go days without water. So they're both important, because it makes sense how water is more important than food in that example, right? And you can go days without water, but you can only go minutes without air. So again, between the two, air is more important than water. And they're both important, but air is more important. Does that make sense? But we go air between air and brain activity or neurological impulse. The brain stops, your neurology stops, you're dead instantly, right? So all these problems I was trying to figure out by just simply addressing the nervous system first is solve all those other problems. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't work on nutrition, exercise, all those different areas, but if you eat a really good diet, but the nerves are choking into your digestive organs, you're not going to absorb those nutrients properly. So if we focus on the area first, like chiropractically, it's going to solve a lot of those other problems that would have maybe come up if we weren't addressing those areas. Okay, making sense? Okay, questions so far? Okay, so I'm going to give you guys this question, we'll start to kind of walk through it, and these are kind of some general ideas, so when we get done, if you've got some specific areas that you want to go through for yourselves, be happy to try to kind of brainstorm on those, but then you can also come up with your own Kind of your own questions that you can walk through as well. So I'll kind of walk you through these one by one and my kind of get your feedback and just some ideas on this, okay? Okay, and I've got some extra, so you're done if you want to take an extra copy or two, you're sure you can as well. Okay, so the first one, I'll give you some ideas on this, you is, um, it's kind of, kind of funky the way I worded it, so hopefully it makes sense, but what are the 20% of foods that you commonly eat that create Oh, I'm sorry, go to the first one. What are the 20% of the time when you make 80% of your um, poor food choices or that impact 80% of your health? So for example, let's say you work a very stressful job and you've got to make a lot of decisions and Monday through Friday, you're pretty good with your health. You exercise, you eat right, but come Friday, in your mind, you've kind of equated to five o'clock as kind of party time. So you go to the Buffalo Wild Wings or Applebee's and you have a couple drinks with your friends, you order a bunch of appetizers and in like, 30 minutes, you eat like 5,000 calories. I'm, I'm you know, I feel a little bit sarcastic, but you've undone all the work that you did in the last five days, and then you wake up the next day, you're tired, you're fatigued, you don't work out on Saturday because you're recovering from Friday night, that rolls over to Sunday, and then Monday, you try to start it all over again, right? So that really small 30 minute window, if you can just fix that, or at least minimize that, you see that's got a huge impact on the whole rest of your week, okay? Can you guys think of some areas for yourselves where this would make sense? That's kind of an extreme example, but... No, you've been following me. <laughs> so I can tell you for myself, for example, here my son, my nine-year-old just got done with his baseball season, and my younger son started his t-ball season. But my middle son, so his games would be at six o'clock at night. So if it was like a Monday night like this, I'd leave here at 5.45 or so, I'd get to the ball fields at six o'clock. His games would get done by like eight or 8.30 at night. And so sometimes I didn't have anything planned, so now it's 8, 30 at night. I don't want to get something from the concession stands there because it's all bad food. But I get home at 8 o'clock, 8, 30 at night, and I'm, at least in my mind, I'm over hungry. So I overeat, and I'm going to bed right after that. I don't sleep as well because I'm inflamed, I'm full, I don't get as good a night's sleep. That rolls over into the next day. And it wasn't even that. It was, it was 24 hours before that that I didn't take 30 minutes to plan, or 30 seconds for that matter, 
to plan something healthy to bring with me, a healthy shake or eating something healthy on the way there that would have solved a lot of those problems. Does that make sense? So I still get home, I have a healthy shake at let's say six o'clock, I get home at eight o'clock at night, I still eat, but I'm not so hungry that I overindulge and kind of blow it, so to speak, okay? So can you see how it can narrow that down? It can be like a, a two minute window that you're planning something or making a decision that's gonna affect dramatically all these different areas. So this is where you've got to take a little time and kind of think through, okay, where do I appear? And this is not just a one-time thing like you messed up on a Friday night six months ago. It's something we regularly do. Maybe it's, you know, every Tuesday night you meet some friends or, um, you know, every Tuesday you guys have a staff meeting. And so every time the staff meeting is done, everybody goes to Starbucks and you buy a 500 calorie latte. Do you know what I mean? And again, it doesn't mean you can't have these things, but being very selective when you're going to do those things. So I know if I'm going to a party, for example, I'll really try to get a really good workout in that day. So my metabolism's gonna be a little bit higher to burn the calories off than I'm gonna eat. And then I'll try to eat a little bit of, I'll have like a shake or something healthy before I go. Cause I love sweets and love desserts. So if there's a bunch of sweets and desserts there, I'm definitely gonna overindulge. But if I go there a little bit full, make that decision ahead of time, I make less, much less of a mistake and much less overindulge. Does that make sense? So you gotta kinda of look at your life and go, where are these two, these little areas, these windows of time that I'm making these decisions? And maybe what's leading to those decisions. Maybe it's, gosh, every time I go and see my mother-in-law, I get so stressed out, I get home and I have 10 drinks because she's stressed me out or whatever, right? So you go, okay, I can't, I'm not gonna not see my mom. I love my mother-in-law, by the way, so I'm not gonna <laughs> do that, for example. But I'm not gonna stop seeing my family or my mother-in-law or whatever, but what can I do to kind of minimize that impact before and after I go? Is that making sense? Do you guys have some ideas on that? Are you already thinking of any questions on that for your specific examples that you wanna ask about? Okay. So kind of continuing with that theme, the next one here is uh, what are the 20% of the foods that you commonly eat that do 80% of the damage to your health? And again, this isn't just the once in a while things, it's like what are the foods that you commonly eat? And it might be we can even dial it down more narrow, what are the ingredients that you eat? Like maybe it's the bad batch or something like that. Is there a particular food that you eat on a regular basis? Or maybe even the time that you eat it, again, maybe late at night or um, those kind of times. So, um, that can be, for example, if you're going to, um, you have your workout scheduled for Friday, but Thursday night you go out with friends and you have a bunch of drinks, things like that, and you're so tired that you miss your workout the next day versus moving that workout to Thursday morning, you still go out with your friends, but you got your workout in first in that, in that scenario. So it's not trying to say, hey, life can't be fun, you can't go out and do fun things, but how do we minimize the damaging things and then maximize the positive things? Okay, making sense so far? Yes. Okay. Questions on those two things? Foods? Yeah. No, no, no questions. Just, okay. Just obvious ones that are so obvious for you. Yeah, so it's like I should have said this at the beginning is that the stuff I'm teaching you tonight is <clears throat> maybe new information, but it's intuitive. It's not like, oh my gosh, it doesn't make any sense. It's not like it's radical, right? It intuitively makes sense to us. But a lot of this, and Elro and I were talking about this this morning, is being mindful, just taking a step back and go, okay, what am I doing? Because so many times we do things, and the way that our brain is wired, we get into habits because that conserves energy. Like every time you had to think about learning how to tie your shoes and spend much energy and effort, it would be much, you know, it would make life would be much harder. So your brain goes, okay, we're gonna have to tie shoes every day, let's make this a neurological pattern so it's really easy to do. So we do certain things, we get in the habit of doing them because we've always done that way. Just like when I was working out an hour and a half, two hours a day, it's like, I gotta do this, I gotta grind it up, I gotta work really hard versus going, okay. Here's other technique. Let's try this and see if it works better. Oh my gosh. And it's radically changed my life because that's the, the style of exercise I've been now for the past 10, 12 years. Okay? So, um, so to the exercise here, okay, what are the 20% of exercises that give you 80% of your results? So again, I used to do all these different exercises. Now I typically do like four or five kind of big body exercises. So I'll do like, um, like a squat, which is going to use all of my legs, and I got to use my upper body to stabilize that. That's gonna burn a lot of calories and build a lot of muscles, but that, that would maybe take me three or four individual exercises to do, right? So that makes sense. Um, I'll do like what's called a bent row, so I've gotta use these legs to stabilize, and I'm lifting weights. I'm using you know, the majority of the muscles in my body for one exercise versus just doing a bicep curl, right? If I had you guys stand up right now and do bicep curls for 10 seconds, first if I had you guys do 10 seconds of squats, you're gonna be huffing and puffing after the squats versus the biceps you're probably not even gonna raise your heart rate very much. Make sense? And these are general ideas. You've gotta to apply it to your life, where you're at right now, which makes the most sense for, for what your desired outcomes are, okay? Okay, so, 
Another thing I want to think about too, again, mentally, is what are the 20% activities that give you 80% of your energy? Okay, and we'll talk about values a later too, but what are the things that you enjoy doing? That, so for example, I'll just tell you for myself, number one, I love to teach. This is one of my favorite things to do. So I have more energy when I get done teaching this than I had before. Because I really enjoy doing this. I enjoy creating classes. I enjoy teaching them. Um, I love to learn. So if I take some time and listen to a podcast, if I read a book, if I do that a little bit each day, even 10 or 20 minutes, that gives me massive energy to repel me through the rest of the day. Versus if there's certain things I've got to do, bookkeeping stuff or computer stuff, it's really draining. So if I do that hour after hour, I'm like just totally wiped out. But if I take a break and know that I've learned something, I get re-energized, okay? So what's important with this is sometimes we, um, we get so busy doing things, we've got to realize I got all these things from my kids or from my business or whatever, that we don't take time to fill ourselves up. And it might be just five or 10 or 15 minutes of doing something that's high in your value list that kind of refills you up, so to speak, and gives you all this energy and momentum to do the other things in life that are also important as well. Does that make sense? Can you guys think of some things for yourselves? Would you guys give me an example or two of that something that, that energizes you that you do? Ideas? Oh, you know, we, uh, we walk, I live up in the hills. And uh, we're trying to drink less of these alcohol abatement strategies. And, but one of them is to take a walk up to the top of our hill and see how from the uh, it's a 20 minute uphill walk. It takes 35 minutes or so to do. And it's sort of, it's, it's like a, instead of a cocktail, it changes your day, it washes the day off, sort of thing. Right. So, yeah, that's one of the few good ones I'm writing down today. You probably <laughs> have more than you think. Ah. Any other? things that you would be potentially doing, you know what I mean? So especially physical stuff is a really great thing too. So, so for myself, I'm definitely a morning person, so sometimes I get home in the evening, if I don't have something planned, because we end up planning every single minute, but if I can go, I'm gonna do five minutes of you know, going for a walk in the yard or 10 minutes, that will change the whole tra trajectory of my afternoon, or the rest of the evening versus, but like, since I get done eating, I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna sit in front of the TV and watch five minutes of TV and relax. Three hours later, you know, you're peeling your butt off the couch versus you just taking five, I'm gonna go for a five minute walk. Now the whole rest of the afternoon you're doing, you know, evening you're doing different things. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then the interesting thing is, I found this six minute ad routine on the internet. And I mean, it's like 30 seconds of stair climbers on the ground, then 30 seconds of plank, then 30 seconds of crunches. And you repeat it four times. You can start with like 10 seconds of each mm -hmm. and do it for, you know, uh, two minutes. But it's amazingly easy to do for two minutes and amazingly hard to do it for six. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always feel guilty about it. It only be six minutes. <laughs> I always thought, well, it's not really a workout. The bad thing about this is you feel like you actually worked out, but now you're starting to make me feel like I actually worked out. <laughs> but I think a lot of the just happened <laughs> what? <laughs> Today that I thought was really great, I'm going to try to remember it, but it said, you have to have, this is going to sound really simple, but think about how profound this is, you have to have a habit before you improve a habit. So, I'll give this example, this guy was going to the gym, he lost over 100 pounds, when he started, he would drive to the gym, he'd walk into the gym, and he would literally do like a minute or two, he'd do like a half of exercise, go back home, get in his car, and drive home. He did this every day for like months, and they're like, was kind of not a waste of time, but now you develop the habit, which is much more important, of the person that goes to the gym and works out. Well, now you can improve that habit versus, well, once I get all my, you know, I gotta you know, hire a personal trainer, I gotta figure out which workout I'm gonna do, I gotta join the gym, I can do all these things first. Well, that doesn't get you a result. Now, some of those things may be necessary, but versus just going, okay, I'm gonna start doing 10 squats a day. Now you did an activity that's moving you closer to your outcome. So that's a good, that's a good point on that. I'm curious to know what other, what other people have is 20% of the foods they eat that produce 80% of your health because it's easy for me to identify the bad ones that I'm doing. To me, I think it's hard for me to identify the good ones. It's really. bad fats. Bad fats. Now, sugar, there's all lots of things, but I can tell for myself if I can avoid bad fats, that eliminates a lot of the other foods. Canola oil, for example, is not technically a bad fat, 
but it's a very damaged, damaged fat. And if I have canola oil, I feel upset stomach, I, feel, I don't feel good, it'll affect me for four, five, six, eight hours. And if I can avoid that, which I do the majority of the time, that's dramatic. So the one thing is I'm just gonna focus on just canola oil and I avoid that, that's gonna have a dramatic impact on my nutrition. That might be different for some people, but it's typically something very, very simple like that. And if you eliminate bad fats, that eliminates a lot of the processed foods well, I am going to huge categories. But I'm just going to look and serve. So I'm trying to avoid, avoid all the bad foods. I'm just going to look for bad fats. If I've got bad fats, I'm going to avoid that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Keeping it really narrow and really, really simple. And I'm curious to know when people talk about the good ones too. Okay. So for me, I'll tell you, and I love you. Yeah, I love your guys' feedback. For me, I grew up in a house where we ate a lot of processed foods, a lot of sugar. I did not eat vegetables. I quote unquote did not like vegetables. When I first met my wife. She's like, "What do you mean you don't like vegetables?" We just got to start eating them. Well, of course, I started eating them. Now I love them, you know? It's just the habit of starting to eat them. So for myself, once I started that habit of just going, every time I eat them, I'm going to have, even if I have pizza, I'm going to have a salad with it. If I have a hamburger, I'm going to have some, you know, vegetables with it. Once I just got in that habit, then it became very easy, right? Even if I'm eating bad food, if I have a little bit of vegetables with it, that makes a big difference. I, I read a book about dieting once, and it said, flavor, flavor your, your vegetables with meat instead of oh, having a big giant meat thing with a few veggies. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, it really had an impact on me. I try to eat more vegetables with a piece of meatball or something, whatever. Mm -hmm. it makes it a hell of a lot more interesting for me. When I tell you how long after we talk about the mental, I talk about my being aware when I'm doing my workouts, being mentally focused. If you just simply do that, if you really just think about your food, like just take your time and enjoy, actually enjoy your food. For example, if you smell your mouth, always gets mad when you do this, but we have, you know, five taste sensation, you know, sweet, sour, bitter, whatever. But they, they can't even identify how many smells. We have millions of smells, like individual smells. So our sense of smell is much more powerful when it comes to the taste of food. You know that when you're stopped up, food doesn't taste as good. So if you just take your time to really smell your food, it's amazing. You become much more aware, you'll be much more aware when you're actually full versus just eating whatever's on your plate. You know what I mean? So just that simple mindfulness really makes a big difference. Okay, um, so I'll go on to see Mike's talk about the energy. What are the 20% activities that create 80% of your energy drain? What are things that you do when you get done doing them just like, just totally zaps you? And again, if you can eliminate those things, obviously eliminate those things. Sometimes we're not even aware of those things. But the other is also going, okay, how can I narrow that down? And also kind of stack it up versus doing, I do a little bit here, a little bit there. If I, if I gotta do an hour and a half of it per week, shut it down and get it all done in an hour and a half on Monday so it's done for the week or whatever time you choose to do it. So that's for the narrowing down part. We all have certain things that we have to do in our life that we don't necessarily truly enjoy, so how do we minimize that? Or potentially find somebody, like I do not like bookkeeping, I don't like accounting stuff. I love health and health chiropractic. So can I find somebody that would be one to have chiropractic that's really good at doing book work and would want to do my book work while I provide them chiropractic care and we both Usually, for those people that love to clean, I don't like to clean, but some people really enjoy that. So they're willing to, you know, you can find an example like that too. So, okay. Now, last couple I'll go through, then we'll go through some specifics. If you guys have questions, you want to brainstorm on yours. But I can tell you that as far as um, what I call book ending your day. So if you can, you know, the middle part of your day, you can't always control. Things are going to come up, different situations, things that you can't always control. But you can really control. You can control what I call the book ending first part of your day, whether that's 20 minutes, a half hour, two hours, whatever you decide that's going to be, and then right the last three, half hour, hour, two hours before you go to bed, you can control those things, you can have a huge impact on the quality of the rest of your day. So, for example, for me, I've got a very specific morning routine that I do, and I do it, I would say probably 90% of the time, occasionally I'll miss it, I almost always do it, and it has a profound impact on the rest of my day. Very simple meditation, visualization, five minute journal that I fill out every single day, very, very simple. But those habits, simple habits repeated over a huge impact on my day. So um, if you look at, let's say, if you look at our um, evening activities, what are the 20% of evening activities that you do that give you 80% of results and benefits the next day? And I'll give you a little extra on that, which is we have limited willpower. Now, we all have willpower. The more decisions we have to make, the more stressed we are, um, the, it wears down our willpower, right? So if you've got to make 20 decisions before noon, and you say, Tara says, I'm not gonna eat any sugar today. And come noon, you've already had to make 20 decisions, and I go, hey, you want a piece of sugar? You're like, ah! You don't even think about it, because your willpower is worn down. 
First, if you only had to make three decisions, your willpower is strong, like, no, 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 I decided not to eat sugar. Does that make sense? So if I can simply, like, for example, the night before, pick out the clothes I'm going to wear, put out my shoes so I'm not having to look for them, that decision's made the night before, that eliminates one decision I have to make that, that morning. And I have more willpower to make good decisions the rest of the day. If I can decide what I'm going to have for breakfast or I'm not going to eat breakfast, I make that decision the night before, I make a healthy shake or decide what I'm going to have. That decision's done, I don't have to think about that. If I have all my keys, all the stuff ready for the next day, I'm not running around the house looking for my keys and getting stressed, that eliminates some of the, you know, it's going to preserve me some willpower for the rest of the day. Does that make sense? So if you can have a good solid morning routine, that might be five minutes for you, it might be 10 minutes, whatever it is for you, evening routine and morning routine, and how's that going to impact your day? Or one of the things, again, that are going to drain it. So for example, I talk about the baseball example. If I did make a decision the day before to have a healthy snack or something prepared for the night before, or the, the baseball, the next baseball game the next day, that's going to have a profound impact on my next couple of days. Is that making sense? So what are those, those decisions, that 20% that's going to create 80% of the problems, and also 20% that's going to create 80% of the benefits the night before and the morning of? Make sense? So my kids, for example, you know, six months ago, my wife's like, so stressful in the morning because we're trying to get everything ready, and then I've got to make the kids um, lunches. And I said, why don't, why don't you have them make it? Why don't they make it the night before? And I suggest, suggest, suggest it to my two older kids. They're like, oh, no, no. And they made it the night before, and that decision, it was just taking a step back and making that conscious decision. And the kids started to enjoy it. They seemed to enjoy the process. It would take them, whatever, five minutes the night before, and eliminate a lot of stress in the morning. Make sense? So thoughts on that, what, do you got, what are some ideas you think of for the morning and evening that either create benefits for you or create problems for you? What would you say in your guys' cases? Alcohol wakes me up in the middle of the night. Mm, okay. Uh, I, love to have, I love to have alcohol, mm -hmm. but uh, it's, I'm getting to the age where it's affecting my body. Right. Uh, and it wakes me up in the middle of the night. I, I also find that once I have two, it's very easy to have four. And once I have four, I feel kind of crummy in the morning, and I have slightly elevated blood pressure in the morning, and that's something that I have to watch out for. So, you know, alcohol is, uh, is something I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, one of the bad things I'm doing. Yes, yeah, so you say that low thing is going okay, to have one drink versus that one turns into two, the two, two is much, you know, like you said, to go to four versus I'm just going to stop at one. Then it has again a profound impact in your next. At the moment, I'm off of it completely to try and break the habit. Which is awesome. I actually, I actually went to him and said, you know, ideas, and he said, uh, he said, uh, measure how much you're doing. And I bought refrigerated magnets, and I was having a lot of alcohol. I mean, I had like four or five refrigerated magnets a day. And I was like, wow, 35 alcoholic beverages. I'm off the charts for what a medical doctor says you're abusing. So, uh, I'm trying to get off of it completely and then maybe go back and try to control it at one a day. Uh, I'm not sure I could do it at two a day. I think then I'm like, woohoo! What do you guys need other ideas for yourselves? She said she stopped watching TV, I mean, dramatically changed the rest of her night. So you don't have to fix the whole night, so I'm just going to, I'm just going to commit to five minutes of exercise. And after five minutes of exercise, or whatever, walking or whatever, and then you say, I still want to sit down and watch TV, great. Just commit to that five minutes, but it'll start to break that cycle. So, yeah, that's good. I mean, good, good awareness on that, so. Okay, um, any other questions? Do you have any questions on your particular areas that you're struggling, how can I switch this, or how can I apply this? I spend a lot of time, like a majority of I mean, I will clean, I, and I'm a germaphobe, so I mean, I clean, 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 clean. 
And my kids are getting to the point where they're like, Mom, you just need to sit down and relax. You, or they want to play a game with me. I'm like, I can't. I'm folding laundry. I can't. So then the guilt sets in. And I should have played with my children today. And instead, I chose to. But, but then when they're crawling around on the floor, they're, you know, like, I mean, next Monday, here we go. I'm going to have another one. So <laughs> um, it's hard. And when my husband does shift work, so he's gone 24 hours a day every third day. So it's, it is a schedule, but it's not. And so I don't know. I have a really hard time managing my time with that because I spend all day cleaning. And, um, and then I've, I've not wasted my day. I've got a lot done. But then my children come. I mean, they're taken care of, but it's it's just the guilt of I should have stopped for five minutes and played a game with them, right. or I should have, you know, because they just want they just want me to they just want me to play with them, or you know, I don't know. Sure. So that's so that might be, and I love you guys. You guys have feedback and ideas this too. Is and it might be defining what is clean, because of course you could clean endlessly. You know what I mean? You could literally clean, especially you have kids, endlessly clean. Um, so what's the definition of you know, when it's clean, so to speak. Like, I'm not gonna have everything perfect, but here's my definition of clean, and once you get to that, whatever that is. And then second, they set the systems in place so that, um, well, let's give an example of my, so my, my two boys um, share a room together, and I mean, I go there at night, some nights, and they're, it, the term a bomb is, looks like a bomb went off, and I literally would, I mean, they're just, I'm like, how do you guys get this mess up? And then we'd fight about it, argue about it, and of course it was late at night, they weren't gonna clean it then, so, so I knew if summer break was coming, I said they're going to be home all day, not all day, but when they're home, there's much more likely to be more and more stuff out. So I started, I just said, I didn't even tell them I was going to do this. I said, hey, okay, you guys got to clean your room before you go to bed tonight. And so I cleaned it. And the next day, I did it again. So you got to clean it. So every day, I'm saying, this got to be clean before you go to bed. Well, after about three or four days, we go in there at night, and it would, it would take them like two minutes to clean it because they had to hold anything out. I didn't say you've got to keep it clean. If you don't keep it clean, you got to, I didn't say like, I just, I just made them clean every single day. And it was dramatically different. So I think they got in the habit, and just psychologically, they knew. I know I'm not to clean it again tonight, so I'm, they're more cognizant of putting stuff away. I don't know if that helps you, mm -hmm. but with your kids too, and go, okay, what can I, you know, Camille's old enough to go, okay, here's, you know, she's responsible enough to, whatever, put X, Y, Z away, or clean up, or whatever, and Keith's a little young, but she could put a couple things away, or whatever, you know what I mean, whatever is realistic. And I started doing that, that seems to be helping a little bit. Today, Camille put all of her clothes away, and usually they're just, like, crammed in the closet, and I have to go maybe eight and a half. Eight, eight, yeah. but, Today she put them away and she did a really good job. So I told her, I said, well, maybe you can earn money with chores, you know, because, so having her have a little list of daily yeah. chores or something. You're ready to just flip-flop it too and go, okay, I'm, I'm committed to spending 20 minutes, whatever it's realistic, 20 minutes first play with my kids. Mm -hmm. So I only have 10 minutes, you know, I, you only have so much time to clean. So put a time limit on it, also go, okay, I'm gonna give myself 10 minutes to clean this room. Whatever's done at 10 minutes is done and that's that's it for the night. Do you know what I mean? Those are some ideas yeah. you kind of, and then you kind of play those in a workbook goals after that. That's a really good thing. So it's just good awareness on that. And, you know, start making I think the working or playing with them first before I even start, because once I get involved in the cleaning, then I don't want to stop in the middle sure. of things. So yeah. I think out front, okay, hey, let's do the next 20 minutes and play, you know, this, this, that, or whatever, and have a, you know. Yes, yeah, so you leave less time to clean, because like you said, you could endlessly. Yeah. Like give me 18 hours, you're gonna clean for 18 hours. Give me 10 hours, you clean for 10 hours. Like give me 20. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm kind of a neat. Journal pose is a tough one. <laughs> yeah. Journal pose. Is a tough well, one. I'm a teacher, so it. Oh man, like, you get it all day, every day. Wow. So my classroom, yeah, it's. Just, now I'll tell you the other side too, as far as from a health perspective, um, there is the what they call it, the um, hygiene hypothesis, which is criminal, not really a hypothesis anymore, is the. the more like say a child that grows up with a pet or two, which you guys have pets as well, they're yeah. exposed to more germs and bacteria at a younger age, they build a stronger immune system and are much less likely to have asthma and allergies later in life. Yeah. So you don't want to necessarily, I'm not saying you clean things, but you don't want to have it too clean. There's a, because yeah. um, you're not exposed to stuff, just like if you never lift weights, your muscles are going to be weak, if your immune system's never challenged. So if you're constantly cleaning everything, you're not exposed to those they're things. To yeah, you're yeah. not home from school. <laughs> <laughs> My son in law is a teacher, and he, his theory is that his seven month old is getting a lot of yeah, antibacterial stuff, stuff out of the way because he's bringing home the sniffles all the time. Yeah, they're exposed to it. I mean, you are anywhere you go, and right. most people don't even know they're contagious. Yeah. You know, at the time. It's too late, mm -hmm. right? Until the symptoms show up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. From the whole class. <laughs> right? <laughs> I was just remembering I spent so much time. Yeah. When my grandparents' farm, I don't. I mean, we were running around in the dirt all day long. Yeah, you're right. It's just, you know, and he'll just. Yeah. My father-in-law, he grew up on a farm, and he was talking about their 
farm was always nice and as, as, as tiny as a farm could be, but he said their neighbors, they would go, you know, help each other with chores and things like that. He said their neighbors were like, he said, I hated, you know, they'd bite you over to eat, you had to eat there. But he said, I hated eating it because it was so dirty. And um, he said they were never sick. Mm -hmm. He'd like, you know, give you some examples, it's pretty interesting. So, okay, any other questions on your specific areas? Last couple of things I'll talk about is um, values. Come in mind with this when I say values, and there's tons, tons of tests you can do online to discover your values. And there's no wrong or right values, but we all have different things that we value higher than others. Okay? So if you have, let's say, if, um, so my parents, for example, my mom's really high value was her kids, you know, taking care of her kids and making sure her kids had all the things that they needed, things like that. My dad loved the, you know, loved us just as much, but he had a higher value on money. When I say money, because he could provide things that we needed, trips and security and things like that. So we had, honestly, a higher value. His, he was more focused on money versus my mom. Doesn't mean one's wrong or right, but you could speak that language to him versus my mom and kids. That makes sense? So you've got to kind of think about that for yourself when you're doing these activities. You want to put your energy into those things that are high value for you, right? So for like an example for myself, I've got a, my truck is, um, I bought it in 2007. It's a nice truck when I bought it, still a nice truck. But I've had it for like 12 years, but I just have less than 100,000 miles in that truck. I just don't drive very much. And if you go on long trips, we take my wife's car. Now, I, I get the urge quite frequently to get a new vehicle with all the new bells and whistles and things like that. And I can afford to do it. I really want to do it. And I think I spend so little time in my vehicle. It's not a high value for me. You know, like having a new vehicle, that would be a bad investment. Now, someday I'll upgrade my vehicle and things like that. But versus getting kind of pulled into the advertisements and see my friends driving a vehicle, I'd like to really get sucked into that. But I'm like, that, I could use that money to invest in other assets, real estate, I could take my family on a trip. Does that make sense? So it doesn't mean it's wrong if you feel like buying a new vehicle, there's nothing wrong with that. But like sometimes we do things because we see other people do them, or we think that's what we want. But in reality, if we really get in line with the values, and it kind of goes back to those things, the things that energize you. If you look at the things that are in your environment, if you look at your desk at work, for example, or at home, and you have a bunch of pictures of your family, do you have a picture of celebrities, do you have um, stuff from trips that you took, what are the things that are really important to you? Again, what are the things that energize you? And uh, where do you invest your money? Or what you, you know, if you have extra money, do you immediately go on a trip? Do you go buy some books to read? Do you go buy some fitness equipment? You know, those are things that are higher on your value list, or your value system, I should say. You want to use these principles to be more efficient in those areas and free up more time to invest in those areas, because those things are going to fill you up. You may think you want more money, but in reality, you just want to have more money to be able to go and travel. How could you set up more for your life for that lifestyle, for example? Does that make sense? So use these things we talked about tonight and make sure they're in line with your values. And if you want, I mean, you can find lots of good stuff online. I took one last week. I found it was really good. So if you're interested, let me know. I'll, I'll just text the link for it. It's free. And I found it to be very, very, very valuable. So, okay? And then obviously the other thing is, again, which is going to go in line with your values, but also your desire. What do you, what do you desire to have right now? Do you want to have more free time? Do you want to have more money? Do you want to have more time with your kids, whatever it is for you, decide what those things are, and then again, use these in mind with your values and your principles to apply those. You don't want to just necessarily apply these haphazardly to do more things that you don't necessarily desire that aren't going to fill you up and make you energize. Because we've all done things like that. We think we, think we want this, we put much energy in there, and you're like, ah, that wasn't really fulfilling, that's not really what I wanted. Not because it was a bad thing, but it just wasn't high in your value list, so to speak. So no things that are wrong or right, you just want to make sure what is right. And you can change your values. It's a little more difficult to do, but it's much easier just, me, just to work in line with what is important to you in terms of your, your values. Is that making sense? Okay. Um, I think, again, a lot of this goes back to the awareness. Kind of one of the last ones I had on here is what are the 20% of activities that give you, um, it, it, as far as sucking your time, problems? I think social media is a huge one for us these days. The news, like I grew up watching the news, and I used to be a news junkie every read the newspaper every single day. I listened because the news wasn't entertainment in my mind. I wasn't watching TV show. That's bad. That's a waste of time. But I sit here and watch two hours of the news station. That's okay. You know, that's why I justify it in my mind. And I start thinking like, this is not my my values. This is not giving me anything of value. This is not improving my life. So I still check the news a little bit, but it's dramatically less than it was. And then it filled it up with stuff that I do. Like I, I subscribe to the podcasts that I want to listen to, not just general podcasts. I find the ones that are, that I want to learn about or YouTube videos and I watch those versus just watching something random that pops up. 
right? Like your Facebook feed, you can't just like control it shows up on there, you're just going through stuff, mining stuff, versus what you can control, or what you choose to spend your time on, invest your time. Make sense? So that's cost versus investment. Cost is you don't get a return. Investment is something that's gonna give you a return in the future, whether it's financially or quality of life, it gets you many more returns over. So um, questions? Thoughts? So before we before we go, and you don't have to share this if you don't want to, but pick at least one or two things you know I'm gonna start applying this tomorrow. Can you guys give me some ideas if you're gonna double this down? I guess the other thing to do that is once you figure those things out, then you try to make those more and more efficient. So if I can work out the 12 minutes instead of two hours, how do I make those 12 minutes better? better? How do I double down on that particular activity to make that more and more efficient and better? Does that make sense? So pick at least one thing you can start either tonight or tomorrow you can start to, to work on this. And you get it more and more defined.